So, can anybody tell me the answer to this? South Korea. Is that the number one in the world? Okay. USA. Next is the USA. Finland. And the United States. Okay, so when we're doing our final marketing plan, do you think this is important? Depends on your product, right? What kind of products is this important for? IT. IT. In Korean people do a lot of internet shopping. I do a lot of internet shopping in Korea. Nowadays. Since I discovered internet shopping, I only go to the grocery shop to buy milk and vegetables and bread. Even cereal, I buy Special K blueberry. I bought about 20 or 30 boxes online. Each box is about 4,000 won. It's much cheaper than than they do the delivery, right? So those kind of things. It's very convenient. What about the GDP per capita of Malaysia? Did anybody find this number? What is the GDP? Six thousand nine hundred and ninety. Is that important if we're selling something in Malaysia to know the GDP? Why is that important? So, do you think you need to tell us the GDP of the country you're selling in? Yes. What do you think is a kind of magic number of GDP that most consumer products com companies think about? What would you say is a magic number that the company says the people's income should be over this number before I enter the market? Around ten thousand dollars, right? Usually the company says the GDP should be over ten thousand dollars US. Then we'll start selling our products in that country, right? So we can check the GDP. Okay, we can check those kinds of things. So just, if I was to ask you without checking, you are selling a uh, kind of high-end makeup product. What country are you going to sell it in? What kind of things are you going to check? You want to sell a high-end makeup product for, for women. Hmm? Competitors? Well, I mean about the economy. <coughs> High income economies, right? so you're probably looking at the OECD countries, right? 26 like countries. Anything else? Maybe GNI. Uh, GNI. GNI is similar, right? Yes. We can check also consumer spending. Consumer spending. How much are the consumers spending, right? Anything else? Income. Women's income, right? How many women are in the workforce? Um, Income of women, right? What else can we check? Uh, the inflation rate. The inflation rate and uh, if the currency is strong. Okay. That could be more generally for most things, right? Yeah. Anything else specific we can check for this product? Statue of women in the society. Okay, so we can check what age do women get married at, right? How many kids do they have? So I mentioned before that some companies were looking at Ireland as a super single culture where the women don't get married until they're more than 30 or don't have children until they're over 30. So there are a lot of single women. In Ireland, at 35 years of age, 50% of 35-year-old women are unmarried. So uh, it's quite high, right? Number. So perhaps they have more disposable income if they don't have kids and they're working. They have more disposable income to spend on those kind of products, right? So we could say Ireland or maybe the Netherlands or somewhere. So we can look at we can look at the economy and choose, right? Using these kind of data, we can use Microsoft Excel. Do you know Microsoft Excel? So we can try to use Microsoft Excel to manipulate the data, use some statistics. Uh, in the real life, it's useful to know about how to use Microsoft Excel, right? So 
So if you take a course in that, it's useful. Uh, so economic information is also important when we are doing our planning about which country to go to. Okay, so uh, what countries did you check? The third question was uh, this one, make a report about the country. So last time we heard about France. Yes. Anybody else? Check. Can they tell us the make some short political and economic report about the country? Hmm? Did anybody else make find some information? China, yes. That's okay. Just tell us. So, uh, after the president Xi Jinping uh, is likely to continue with an aggressive anti-corruption -cor campaign in 2015 and 2016, uh, mm -hmm. um, it may cause some uh, uh, tensions of the. Uh, uh, within the ruling Chinese Communist uh, Party, and uh, uh, however, uh, the political system is expected to avoid major is the instability in the two years. Okay, I'm to guess. And uh, uh, and also the campaign may cause to some. Uh, uh, problems in the state-owned uh, enterprises, uh, they may reform it, and uh, uh, especially in the energy sector. Okay. Anything else? Uh, and uh, economic structure is. Hmm? Uh, so uh, is the uh, is. Diversified in most respects, and uh, uh, but most parts of the current economic reform drive, particularly those relating to financial uh, liberalis liber liberalization, uh, could cause instability, and a glut of real estate supply poses a substantial threat. A glut of real estate supply. Uh, supply poses poses a substantial threat. Okay, so we could have a real estate bubble, with the, like in the U.S., where the real estate price goes down, right? Yeah. Do you understand glut? Glut means like glut or lot. These days we have global savings glut. It means that. The population is getting older, people have a lot of savings, the money is going around the world, right, making bubbles, blowing bubbles up. So there could, there was, in China now there is a glut of real estate supply, too much real estate. So, problem with real estate is people don't think enough about supply and demand. So if you buy a house someday, you should check about the supply and demand before you buy the house, okay? So people just buy a house because somebody else is buying a house or so on. Okay? So in China, there, this economic report says the supply is high, so the price could start to fall down. Right? What's the problem if the real estate price falls? Isn't that good for everybody? Lowered house, cheap houses? It's not good? Yes, cheap houses is good for everybody, right? Yeah. Society would be better off if everybody could have a free house, right? Yeah. But uh, we can see Singapore, one of Singapore's successes was that 80% of the population owns their own home. It's through the government housing system. So the government made buys, because Singapore was like a dictatorship, the government could just confiscate the land from the farmers and pay them some cheap money to increase the supply of the land. So they could make cheap, cheaper housing for the people. Then, because people have a cheap housing, they feel more involved in their country, right? They feel like they have a stake in their country. And this was one of the reasons why Singapore was able to grow its economy, right? So cheap housing is good. 
there's no reason that if housing is too expensive, it's bad for a society. But if the house price falls suddenly, it can cause economic problems, like in the US, right? People's wealth goes, goes down. The homeowner wealth goes down. Even though it's not real wealth, still the banks, mainly the banks are going to have problems. Okay? If this happens, the banks in China could have financial system could have problems, right? So we have some kind of economic risk or political risk. Okay, so thank you. So another country. Did you guys check? You guys said that you're going to do India for your country. 
Hmm? You just decided to do India, you didn't check the, the risk yet. Yes. So one co co group is doing the US and one group is doing India. That those countries are taken. Okay. So <coughs> Uh, which country do you prefer to invest in then, nowadays, China or the U.S.? If you did, if you you heard a very short political and economic risk report, which country do you think is better to invest in now, China or the U.S.? Just on this short report, China. You think China? Why? I think it's not a big problem. I'm asking where do you want to invest? You want to invest in China or you don't want to invest in China? China. Yes, why? Because they're reforming the policy. You think this is better for the long term? Yeah. This kind of risk might be just short term, but better in the long term. You're a long term investor? Okay. What about the real estate risk in China? Another economic risk in China is the stock market is highly leveraged. It means that a lot of people took out loans to buy the stock. The stock market went up 80% in Shanghai last year. Usually when the stock market goes up that quickly, it could be coming down again in the future, right? So a lot of individual investors took loans from the bank to buy stocks. So you could check the stock market. How much of the stocks were paid for by loans or how much was paid for people's, right? If the stock market starts to go down, we can have problems. Unemployment, companies are not doing well, right? So that could be another risk in China. But we have to understand the news as well. Uh, we can understand that the Western news has a little bit of bias. For the last five years, many people in the Financial Times or Bloomberg, Western economists have been saying, oh, China's economy is a bubble. Don't invest in China, right? <laughs> Invest in the US, China's going to have a bubble. Even the rating agencies, before the 2009 financial crisis, they were giving A, A ratings to US banks and D ratings to Chinese banks. Just a, maybe a month later or two months later, Chinese bank has no problem, but the US bank is bankrupt, right? So after this time, the Chinese decided to make their own rating agency. So China now has its own rating agency. China rating agency gives different ratings, gives the US companies lower ratings, Chinese companies higher ratings, right? There's also a European rating agency starting. So we can, we're, the information that I pointed you to, like the Economist Intelligence Unit and so on, it's generally okay, right? But we have to understand if we read like Bloomberg or Financial Times in the UK, there might be some bias, Western bias. So we, we read their risk assessment, but we also have to think for ourselves, or it's a good idea to check some Chinese sources or other sources too, about the risk, okay? So we can get a ba more balanced idea about the political and economic risks. So uh, let's move on then to the legal environment. Do you have any questions about the political or economic environment? Do you know anything about law? Has anybody studied law before? Yes, you studied law. What kind of law did you study? Um, all kinds of Czech law, or well, something from that, and mm. then Danish law and EU law. Okay. Is the law the same in every country? No. Is it different? Yes. Yes. What about in the EU? You have, we have EU law. What does that mean? How can you have EU. Danish law and EU law at the same time? It's, it's the same for all EU members, mm. but there are still some exceptions and we can apply the Danish law on top of the EU law and then this law on top of the EU law and blah blah blah. Okay, so what kind of laws are for the EU? Uh, for all of the EU? All of the EU. The, this Hague Convention, for example, okay. uh, so, the Brussels law. Yeah, so things like the environment, competition, those yeah. big general areas, you have the EU law, right? Then more specific 
areas underneath, we have the national law. Okay? So, we also have that in international law. We have some international agreements and treaties, right? Which is dealing with bigger things like torture, right? Or something like that. Big areas. Uh, we had the Kyoto Protocol about the environment. But some countries uh, didn't sign this treaty, right? For example, the US didn't sign up to the Greenhouse Gas Treaty. So basically, we have some international laws in the EU. It's a grouping together where we have a stronger kind of international law. But most countries have their own legal system, okay? With their own laws, which are different than other countries. So what is the problem for your company? That different countries have different laws. What could be a problem for your company? You're, you're used to selling your product in Korea, now you need to sell your product in Europe. Europe has different laws than Korea. How is that going to affect your company? <clears throat> many, many export our product to foreign mm -hmm. countries. Mm -hmm. uh, unexpected regulation will happen. Yes, have, for example? For example, uh, our product of quality is bad. Uh, uh, according to, uh, is bad according to their foreign countries. Uh, stand up, I think. Great. Okay, so you don't meet the quality standard, a certain yeah. quality or safety, yeah. usually safety or health and safety standard. Yeah, probably. Yeah, so you can't, right? So, for yeah. example, drugs, pharmaceutical drugs, right? They're often very different. Mm -hmm. You can take this drug in this country, it's not allowed in this country. Okay, so you have to change it. Okay, so companies have various legal and regulatory hurdles. Hurdle is something blocking or you have to jump over. Local legal systems determine, decide how business is conducted. Internal regulations exist only to the extent that individual countries agree to follow certain standards of conduct. Do you think that uh, all of the countries in the world are good at agreeing on laws or not good? It's easy for all the countries in the world to agree on the same law or they have different opinions? Is it easy for those different opinions to be brought together? No. How many countries are in the world? About 200 countries, right? So we group them. We have OECD countries, 26. We have emerging countries, 100. Okay? Then we have uh, so-called, uh, before they were called third world countries, right? or uh, about 60, okay, or 65. So actually in the UN they work in groups together. Usually the emerging economies work in the same group, right? We also have the G20, do you know the G20, group of 20, yes. right? So before the G7 was important, group of seven, they would get together, decide on the laws, and then they would present them to the other countries and say, here's what we decided. Do you agree or not? What? You don't agree? Okay, you're not in the treaty. Okay, do you agree? Okay. Uh, do they? Did the other countries have much input? No. Right? So, even in international politics, we have some countries, like uh, the US might say to one country, well, if you support us about the Ukraine, we will, uh, you know, we'll do this, we can give you this favor or another favor. So, uh, that can happen in the real life, right? So nowadays the G20 is more important. So nowadays there is 20 countries who are discussing the regulation. For example, financial regulation. They want to make the same kind of financial regulation to reduce the risk. For example, the bank should have at least 10% uh, capital or equity. Okay. So if we make this for all our G20 countries, this rule, we can make a safer financial system. Okay, if we make this law for the environment, for all the G20 countries, we can make a better environment system. But is it easy for, even for 20 countries to make an agreement? No, so a lot of people complain about the G20. They say that they're just wasting their time because they don't make enough solid uh, 
actions, right? At the end, they have a meeting and at the end they come out with a statement like, we all agreed that the environment is important for the world. Okay? End of the meeting. So, of course, the environment is important for the world, right? So, did they need to have a meeting to say that? It means that they couldn't agree on what they're going to do exactly, or on a law. So, this is how uh, the things work. So, the G20 get together, then make a law. Let's say the G20 make a financial law. The UK doesn't agree. 19 countries agree, but the UK doesn't agree. What can they do? They just have two choices. Make the treaty without the UK or go ahead. Or just forget about it. Right? So, if they make financial regulation on all the other countries, and the U not the UK, the UK gets some advantage. All the banks could move to the UK because they, they have light regulation. Okay? The other countries have strict regulation. So this is the problem. And this is why even though 19 countries agree, they might say, just forget it. The UK doesn't agree, so just forget it. So actually this happened, and the UK's excuse was that Singapore is not in the G20. So they said, well, the G20 can all make this strict law on financial regulation. But if we make that law, all the banks are going to leave New York and London and move to Singapore. Right? Do you agree with David Cameron, the British Prime Minister? Do you think if the G20 makes strict regulation, all the banks will go to one country in the world which does not make the regulation, like Singapore? Hmm? No, I don't agree with him. Right? Because we can see countries like Sweden and Norway, which make a high tax or very strict regulation about the environment or other areas. And the companies don't leave Sweden or Norway that quickly, right? So it's my opinion, David Cameron is exaggerating because the financial industry is so important to the UK. Okay, we talked about national champion, right? The financial industry is a national champion in the UK, so David Cameron doesn't want the strict laws about the financial industry. So he makes some excuse, like, oh, but all the banks will go to Singapore, it's not fair, so I don't agree. Right? So then it's not easy to make the law. So can you understand the problem about making international law? Countries have their own national champions, they have their own interests. Okay? They, it's hard for them to agree even on principles. <coughs> so, uh, we are going to talk about the basis, the different types of legal systems we have in the world. What happens if there is a legal dispute, international legal dispute? Jurisdiction means where is that decided? How can we resolve a dispute if we have a dispute with another company? Okay. Intellectual property, and cyber law, commercial law. So we have these main laws in the world. The top two is common law or civil law. Civil law comes from the Romans. Do you know the Romans? Do you know where the ancient Roman Empire was? More or less? in Europe, right? Country, mainly in France, Italy, Spain, across to Germany, was the Roman Empire. The Romans liked to make lists. They made a lot of lists of things. So this law is called, also called code, code law. Do you understand code? In this law they make a lot of codes, lists, telling you exactly what you can and cannot do. Precisely. Okay? You can't do this, you can't do this. What does it say in the code? This is civil law. We made, this code was made over history since the Romans had changed. Okay? Napoleon. When Napoleon made the emperor of France, he made a republic in France, he used this kind of law too, code. So a lot of countries based their legal system on France, France's republic. Because France was the first country to make a republic. Do you know there was a monarchy before? Do you understand monarchy and republic? Monarchy is the king. What countries are left in the world today which has a monarchy? Denmark. Uh, I mean a monarchy political system, ruling the country. In the UK, the monarchy is not important. It's just a nice old lady, right? Who goes to wave to the people. Doesn't have any power. Okay? But where in the world is the monarch Arabic running the country? Arabic countries. Like 200 years ago, yes. So Saudi Arabia is the main one, right? So they never had to change. Why did Saudi Arabia never have to change their system of monarchy? 
Why do you think? Other countries had changed their system. They had a revolution and they had a republic. Got rid of the king. Yes? Because, because people still keep accepting the laws right there. So they don't feel like they should change them. Right? They're a very strict religion. Very strict Muslim religion. Right? But also Saudi Arabia has oil. So it never needed to change. Okay? People are happy. The king gives the people a lot of money. If you lived in Saudi Arabia, you'd get a lot of money for free. Right? Even the normal people, they have chauffeurs driving them around in their car. Social welfare is very high. The government pays for people to go to university in the US, for example. Abroad, right? Because the king has so much money, he just gives the money to the citizens. There was some problem in the Middle East a few years ago. What did the Saudi Arabian king do to solve the problem? Some people started to demonstrate in Saudi Arabia. If you were the king, what would you do? People are starting to demonstrate they want to change from monarchy to republic. You have a lot of money from oil. Yeah. Yes, they increase the money for the people. 50% more money. Everybody. Hey. Okay. No demonstrations. Demonstration was finished, right? So I guess that as soon as the oil runs out, the monarchy will be finished in Saudi Arabia, right? But most other countries, uh, the monarchy finished after the, the French Revolution was the start with Napoleon, right? Then in other countries, the monarchy fell and they became republics. So Napoleon made his civil or code law. So most of the countries followed this law. For example, in the Middle East, uh, countries like Egypt, right? They use civil law. After they got their independence, especially after the First and Second World War, a lot of countries got independence. They decided to use this system. A lot of codes, right? So Korea is using this system. Okay, Korea also got its independence in after the World Wars, right? So it, it also took this based on the French, French Napoleon's French idea as the basis, right? Longer basis is the Romans. Then we have common law. Common law is used mainly in the Anglo-Saxon world, the British Empire countries. Okay, you know the countries of the British Empire? Hmm? What countries were in the British Empire? Ireland? Wales, Wales, Wales uh, Australia, Canada. India, Canada, right? So most of the world is using this, Anglo-Saxon countries are using this. Common law is based on principles. Common law is more based on principles from the past. So something happened in the past, we made principle based on this case. So then we decide now what to do, based on the previous case, okay? So also in the US, was also in the British Empire, right? So it means that in, they're looking at the former case. The judge already decided on a case 50 years ago. So this principle from that case, we take and apply it to our case. And then we see what will happen. So this is more like common law. So this is based more on the tradition and the decisions in the past, in past cases. Okay, then we have Islamic law. Islamic law is based uh, very much on religion, on the Quran, right? For example, in Islamic law you're not allowed to pay interest. So the banking system is not well developed in these countries. Okay? It used to be like that in the Catholic religion 800 years ago. Okay? Only the the Jewish people charged interest because the Christians didn't, so the Jewish became big bankers in Europe because of that reason, right? But these days the Islamic countries don't charge interest. So if you get a loan from someone, you just pay them back the same amount of money later. Based on the, uh, the law of the Bible, right? So Marxist socialist penance uh, is used in some Marxist former Marxist countries, not many. Okay. So, <coughs> every country's law is based on one of these main legal systems, but we might have different interpretations in a different country. So, com just to resume, common law makes decisions through the past decisions. They look at the past decision of the court and apply it these days. So, we have established and customary law principles. Do you understand principle? Principle is general idea. Okay, and then we, we apply this general idea to a set of facts. The facts are different every time. 
Okay? Ownership is established by use. In Ireland, if I use the land for 15 years, right, then I can own the land. I was using it for 15 years, even though in paper somebody else owns the land, it doesn't matter. They weren't using it and they didn't care. So the land is now mine after 15 years. Okay? Whereas in code law, it's written on the paper, the land belongs to you. So that's the most important thing. Okay? Code law, we have commercial, civil and criminal uh, codes, a list of rules. Ownership is determined by registration, not by use. Islamic law is uh, the Quran, the Quran. Okay, so it talks about property rights, economic decisions, economic freedoms. Uh, the Islamic system is mainly based on ethical, moral, social and religious dimensions. If you look at the constitution of Iran, Iran and Saudi Arabia are the two most strict forms of Islam, right? The constitution of Iran says nothing about money or GDP. The constitution of Iran talks about these kinds of things. Okay, equality, fairness, social justice. So the aim of the country of Iran is not for the people to be rich, right? The aim of the country of Iran is not to make a high GDP. Most countries want to get the high GDP and create prosperity for the people, right? But Iran is not like that, it's different. It doesn't mention that anywhere in its constitution. Okay? They have a different system in Iran, very strict uh, Islamic system. So, what about if we have a, a legal dispute with another company from another country? I ordered something from Russia, you didn't send it to me. Okay, I want to sue you. Where am I going to sue? In Russia or in Korea? It depends. What does it depend on? Uh, we need to decide before what kind of law we are going to use in, in a case of dispute and what venue are we going to use. Yeah, so we have to write in the contract. Very simple answer, right? We should have, what if we didn't write it in the contract? Then we use automatically the highest one of both the countries, right? What do you mean the highest one? Uh, the, the common one, I'm, I'm, I can't express myself now. Oh, do you mean the one where most of the transaction is being carried out? No, no. Uh -huh. um, I, I can't. I can't really express myself. Okay. Right? <laughs> so we can have legal disputes between governments, between a company and a government. Uh, governments are also big business. You don't have. We have B two B, B two C. We also have B two G. Okay? Governments are big business. You can sell things to the government, right? You have in Korea, you have a good traffic camera system or a good camera system. You can sell that to the government in the Netherlands for millions or billions of dollars, right? New camera system for the roads. So, usually, first of all, we should put the clause in the contract. So we could finish here. Now you learned that if you ever make a contract with somebody abroad. You have to put a clause. Do you understand the clause? What does that mean? Sentence. Why right? put a sentence in the contract which says, in the event of a dispute, this dispute will be decided in, where are you going to put it if you're writing the contract? Korea or Russia? Korea, right? Then are you going to agree? No. <laughs> no? Then no contract. No business, right? So it depends a little bit who wants the business more. But well, you're selling, you're selling to her, right? So maybe you want the business more. So maybe you agree. Okay? If you don't agree, you can always put Californian law. It doesn't have to be your country or your country. A lot of companies put Californian law. Maybe not practical for Russia and Korea because too far away, but if you're a big company like Samsung and Petrol, what's the name of the company? Gas, gas from in, in Korea, make a contract. They might put Californian law, right? Because then it's okay, they both have the money to hire a lawyer in California, right? And it will be decided by a court in California, okay? Both of them understand, there are a lot of lawyers in California. The US has by far the most highest percentage of lawyers to have a population in the world, okay? So Californian law is probably the most common one for two countries who want to find a neutral country, okay? 
The next one is where did we make the contract? Did you fly to Russia? Did you fly to Korea? Okay. Where was the contract made and signed? Okay. Maybe you were the seller, so you flew to Korea because you want to sell your product, right? So we didn't say where, but we made the contract in Korea, then it would be Korea. Then this is where the provisions of the contract were performed. So where was most of the contract performed? Okay. Then that's another way. So just we should put in a clause, basically, in the contract. So the next one is uh, litigation. Do you understand litigation? Litigation means that uh, when somebody sues us or makes a, uh, they make a some litigation means take us to court. We have an argument. So the best advice is to seek settlement. So we should try and settle by ourselves first without going to court. Okay. Why, why, why is it better for companies to solve the problem by themselves without going to court? What do you think? You have to pay, that's the biggest one. I pay. Are lawyers cheap? No, they're not. They charge hundreds of dollars an hour, right? For every hour they spend working on the case. Any other reason? What about Samsung and Apple? They had a famous court battle. Do you think they spent a lot of money on the court battle, right? Samsung won in some countries, Apple won in other countries. So we can see how countries have different legal systems, right? The same case was taken in different countries, and some countries one company won, some countries the other company won, right? What other effect, bad effect did Samsung and Apple get from this case, apart from the cost of the lawyers and taking the cases? would have been better if they could have settled. Public image. Okay, public image. It's like, did you ever hear the expression in English to wash your dirty laundry in public? This is a phrase in English, wash your dirty laundry in public. Everybody can see your dirty clothes, right? So we don't want everybody to know about, because in a court case, all the information comes out. A lot of information comes out about what's happening in our company and so on. So we can make a poor image, it's bad for PR. We can get unfair treatment in a foreign court. Apple won in the US, Samsung won in Korea. Okay, are you surprised? Mm -hmm could be some bias, right? Because especially in the US they use the jury system, right? Jury is 12 people decide, so the jury is all Americans, right? Maybe they're not as impartial as the judge. They're not trained like the judge to be impartial, okay? Difficulty in collecting a judgment. Even though the court decides that we should pay, can we collect the money? We lose our confidentiality and lose the cost. So what's a better way to do this? First of all is mediation. This is the first step. Okay, we've seen that uh, Samsung is releasing a new phone with Microsoft. So you will have the desktop, the home screen on the Samsung phone. So Samsung and Microsoft also had a case against each other. But they decided to settle outside of court and then start to cooperate. Okay? So it can be an advantage for the companies not to go to court. It makes a better relationship between the two companies too. They can settle between themselves. Okay, so a mediator can certainly help in this regard. Have you heard of mediation before? No? Uh, mediation is that you two guys have your legal dispute, right? Or you're having a fight about something. So. I am the mediator. I come between you two and I try to solve the problem. So a mediator's job is to listen to both sides, okay? Try to find some way to make them agree. Then the mediator proposes a solution and uh, you decide whether you accept the solution or not. It's up to you. You don't have to accept the solution. So mediation is very often used in disputes, very common way. 
if you say that some workers are on strike, they're having a dispute with the company, we bring in a mediator. Usually they are a trained mediator, you can train to be a mediator, and usually they are, have experience with that business or that company. So they already kind of know what, what uh, to do. So the mediator listens to both sides and they offer a reasonable solution. Both parties should accept the decision. So we're, I'm supposed to accept the decision, but it's not legally binding. I can say that I don't accept. I don't accept the decision. That's okay. So if I don't accept this, then we need to go to the next step. The next step is arbitration. Arbitration is basically the same as mediation, except at the end, you have to accept, legally. You sign a document at the start, which says, whatever the arbitrator decides is legally binding. So you have to follow whatever the arbitrator says. So an arbitrator is appointed, usually a person with some expertise in the area. Both sides legally agree to accept the arbitrator's decision. Much cheaper than litigation. It's like a private judge, right? Cheaper than going to court, because uh, you don't have to pay for the lawyers and the court fees and so on. Less public than going to court solves this problem of public image, right? Bad public image, confidentiality, takes longer. The court system is backlogged, there's a big delay. So this is getting more and more popular these days, not just with companies, but also people with like going through divorce or child settlement or those kind of things, right? Why? It's cheaper and it's private, okay? And you have one person that you both agree to, expert in the area, they are going to make the decision, okay? So we have associations of arbitrators, international ones, and ones in your country that you could contact and you can uh, hire them and they will decide your case. Okay? So this is getting more and more popular as time goes by. If you have a dispute in Korea, for example, one of my friends owns his own Hogwan. He had a dispute with uh, one of the suppliers of the Hogwan, legal dispute. So before it went to court, they went to the mediation. The Korean government provides free mediation okay, to stop people from going to the courts about these little things, right? So they went to the mediation, and the guy listened to both sides, and the guy decided in favor of, a little bit in favor of my friend, right? And the other supplier didn't like that, but he knew that he, basically the other supplier was just trying to get away with, uh, get away with, bad quality work, right? So he just chat, he went to the mediation and he knew that he lost in the mediation. So the next step after mediation is going to be arbitration or court. So the supplier just gave up at the mediation. He said, okay, then you can have what you want, okay? So this is the use of the mediation. Okay, the people can solve the problem early without going to court, right? And it's a, in between, it's a way if you don't do anything, you could leave your problem unsolved. But at least with a mediator, they can say, no, you're wrong, right? Or you're right. Or this is my suggestion about what should happen. So we can do that without spending a lot of money okay? and get a result. Might be better for both people. So let's uh, take a break now for 10 minutes. Yeah.